Here's what's coming up on the world today. The UN calls for millions of dollars in donations to help fix Afghanistan following the Taliban takeover. North Korea tests a new long-range uh, cruise missile capable of hitting much of Japan. Plus, nearly 60 people dead from dengue fever in India's Uttar Pradesh state. A warm welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. It's a solemn cry coming from the United Nations calling for the world to be more sympathetic to the poverty and hunger that exists in Afghanistan as the Taliban takes over. A call is coming from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who says as much as $606 million would be needed as foreign aid has dried up. He told a conference in Geneva earlier today that Afghans are perhaps facing the most perilous hour. The people of Afghanistan need a lifeline. After decades of war, suffering and insecurity, they face perhaps their most perilous hour. Now is the time for the international community to stand with them. And let us be clear, this conference is not simply about what we will give to the people of Afghanistan. It is about what we owe. We need to ensure that our humanitarian response saves lives, but also saves livelihoods. The people of Afghanistan are facing the collapse of an entire country all at once. Afghanistan faces a development emergency, and we must protect the progress of the two last decades. Almost echoing the Secretary General's call is the United Nations Human Rights Chief who has criticized the Taliban's record since seizing power in the country. Michelle Bachelet told the Human Rights Council in Geneva that Afghanistan was in a new and perilous phase, with many women and members of ethnic groups and religious communities deeply concerned for their rights. Facing deepening humanitarian and economic crisis, the country has entered a new and perilous phase which many Afghans, profoundly concerned for their human rights, particularly women, ethnic and religious communities. Although the Taliban has issued public statements purporting to grant amnesty to former security personnel and civil, civil servants, prohibiting house-to-house -house searches and assuring women's rights under Islamic law, information that we have cross-checked to the extent possible and which we assess to be well-founded indicates that practice on the grounds have often contradicted these stated commitments. Importantly, and in contradiction to assurances that the Taliban would uphold women's rights over the past few weeks, women have instead been progressively excluded from the public sphere. In many areas, they are prohibited from appearing in public spaces without a male chaperone. In numerous professional sectors, women face increasing restrictions. Taliban representatives have limited girls' access to education with girls over 12, prohibited from attending schools in several locations. Back in Afghanistan, a senior Taliban leader says the interim government is in talks with the international community and was that they will not go to the extent where they are sanctioned. Taliban leader Kari Saeed Koste said, and I'm quoting here, we assure you that the cabinet members of the Islamic Emirate are doing their respective jobs, specifically the foreign ministry or those in talks with the international community to resolve issues. He made the comments as the meeting in Geneva wore on. Now, even before the Taliban seizure of Kabul last month, half the population, that's about 18 million people, were dependent on aid. That figure looks set to increase due to droughts and shortage of cash and food, according to UN officials and aid groups. It was only yesterday Afghanistan, the Afghanistan uh, Taliban government announced a new e education policies, but uh, the female students, it says, can attend higher education institutions and universities, but in gender-separated classes. He was explaining what he said yesterday. He said that the um, administration would allow boys and girls not to study together, 
they will be separated as co-education schemes are declared to be against Islamic principle and national values. And later in an interview, he said he believes the gender segregation policy that has already been practiced as some private institutions has brought no negative impact and even positively changed things in the country. Officials have said that Islamic dress code will be mandatory but they do not specify what that means. A Taliban has repeatedly claimed that their attitudes towards women have evolved since the 1990s when women and girls were forbidden from holding jobs or going to school. Qatar's foreign minister in, says the Gulf state has urged Afghanistan's new Taliban rulers to respect women's rights and that it is still too early to consider recognizing their government. Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdurrahman Al Thani was speaking at a joint news conference with French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Lourdion in Doha. Lourdion said dozens of French nationals are still in Afghanistan and Paris is working with Qatar to evacuate them. We believe that uh, uh, keeping insisting on the issue of recognition right now is not going to be helpful for, for anyone. What we believe can be helpful and can be more constructive is to engage with them to make sure that the commitments that they put forward will be implemented. Uh, for sure, uh, them as a government, they want uh, their uh, response to us, that they want to be open with the international community, they want to engage, they want to encourage the embassies to come, but this will need a lot of homework to be done uh, by them. And our advice and urging to them all the time that to be open, to be engaging, to fulfill uh, the expectations that the international community has. The VOA's Afghanistan Pakistan Bureau Chief Aisha Tanzim joins us now. She's in Islamabad. Aisha, great to see you as always. Now, the new education policy was much expected. We've seen the Taliban do this before. But how are people reacting to the new rules? I mean, that for as long as the Taliban is in power in Afghanistan, this is how life is going to be. Well, right now, it's too early to see exactly how the students feel. The student body right now that we've talked to is concerned about their future. They're saying that hardly any students and hardly any teachers are coming to colleges and universities to teach them. The spaces are empty. And as we have seen, uh, some women have been allowed to come back to private universities, but the classrooms are segregated. The interesting thing to note going forward, uh, annoying that 120,000, more than 120,000 people have left Afghanistan, many of them academics, many of them educated um, Afghans. How many female and how many male teachers and professors are left in the country? Uh, because it's one thing to segregate the classes, it's another thing to provide enough teachers in all subjects for both male and female students. So that's one of the biggest concerns that if you uh, segregate classes, do you have enough female teachers, which is what Taliban have said is needed to teach uh, female students. Uh, although they have said that in uh, some circumstances, a male teacher may be allowed to teach female students, but in general, uh, they would insist on female teachers for female students. They've also said that they're changing some subjects. Um, they have not identified exactly which subjects. We saw in Takhar province, for example, that the local Taliban commanders removed uh, some subjects related to sports and some other things from the curriculum and added more Islamist, uh, uh, you know, teachings uh, in the curriculum. Um, so we don't know exactly what changes are coming. Indeed, and uh, it sounds uh, the, the state is becoming more significant uh, with its uh, new name, the Islamic Emirate. A UN Human Rights uh, Commissioner, uh, Michelle Bachelet, is concerned the Taliban is breaking its promises, including over women. But the education minister says that the Taliban is not stopping women from studying. They only have to abide by the rules. Are there any human rights groups left back in Afghanistan who are calling for the Taliban to keep their promises? Yes, a lot of them. And even those who do not have personnel on the ground are calling from abroad. So Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, a lot of international groups. 
and local activists. Uh, I talked to a couple of women activists who are saying that um, uh, they're still fighting for the international community to not recognize the Taliban as a government until they meet their promises. And they're saying they're not planning to flee Afghanistan. They will stay and fight. Uh, however, uh, if the international community recognizes the, uh, the Taliban government, the Islamic Emirate as a legitimate government, then they feel they'll have no choice but to leave. But until then, they're planning to stay and fight to convince the international community to hold the Taliban's feet to the fire, to hold them accountable, especially on promises to women. Uh, there is no uh, female minister in the Afghan cabinet. There's no indication that the Taliban intends to add a female minister, even though in some ministries like the health and education ministry. And today I saw a tweet that even at Kabul airport, women are uh, back to work. Uh, but they're more covered than we used to see them before uh, in Kabul and other places. So women are allowed back in some ministries, some subjects, but uh, uh, not at the top levels of the government and not in every, uh, uh, not in everything. So uh, we've heard from the UN that a lot of female NGOs, uh, NGOs that worked exclusively on women's rights have been harassed and have been targeted. Yeah, and the situation uh, keeps unfolding. You heard the UN Secretary General earlier saying that the world needs to raise at least $606 million for Afghanistan. Uh, poverty and hunger are spiraling since the Taliban took over. Kind of makes you wonder, you know, what really uh, these uh, foreign allies have been doing on the ground just before their departure. But um, the Taliban do not want external help. They've said that before although they said today they're still working with the international community um, to work out some modalities. But are, are there expected new economic policies uh, to, be addre to address the situation on the ground? Are you hearing anything towards that direction? Well, actually, the Taliban uh, do want external help, and they've said it um, time and again that they've said that they want international community to come to their aid they have said that uh, Afghanistan's economy is not doing good and they want people uh, international community to not just give humanitarian aid but also provide investment so for example they said China can be a big partner in investing and can bring its Belt and Road initiative to Afghanistan and through Afghanistan to Central Asia uh, but they recently met the UN humanitarian coordinator as well um, and um, but internally for their own economy they have ordered that all transactions be done in Afghani currency. Um, uh, previously, dollar was uh, big in Afghanistan. You could buy and sell in dollars. You could uh, you could withdraw dollars from ATM and banks and Western Union. The Taliban have, in order to preserve dollar and the flight of dollar, said everything will be done in Afghani. And, and they do uh, say that they want to increase trade. Uh, they want to make economic policies that will relieve uh, some of the pain, uh, but on a on some level, the Taliban do realize that the problem is too big, and without external help, they will not be able to handle it on their own. Another humanitarian crisis brewing on the ground in Afghanistan. Aisha, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for having me. We're still watching the world today. We have more stories coming up. Plus. I want to stay back for this one, uh, listening to a concert on London's waterways. Stay with us. Welcome back to the world today. Let's keep you updated on the other big story happening uh, on in the world today, which is North Korea carrying out successful tests of a new long-range cruise missile over the weekend, according to state media KCNA, amid a protracted standoff with the United States over denuclearization. The missiles flew 1,500 kilometers before hitting their targets and falling into the country's territorial waters during the tests held on Saturday and on Sunday. Photographs were released by KCNA. 
which cannot be independently verified. But missiles were seen being launched from a transporter, erector, launcher, and then flying. It was seen as the North's first missile launch after it tested a new tactical short-range ballistic missile in March. North Korea also conducted a cruise missile test just hours after U.S. President Joe Biden took over office in late January. The North's neighbor, South Korea, says it is cooperating with the United States on a detailed analysis with regards to that latest missile test by North Korea. Earlier today, the North state media had reported it did carry out successfully the long-range cruise missile test over the weekend. But according to the South Korean uh, spokeswoman, of the Ministry of Unification, a military hotline between the South and North is not working normally. That's what she said when she was asked about the North's movements. It was seen as North Korea's first launch, as we said, after it tested a new tactical short-range ballistic missile in March. North Korea also conducted cruise missile tests just hours after Joe Biden was sworn in. And the South Korean and Australian foreign ministers have both been talking about uh, that missile launch, uh, calling for dialogue with North Korea after reports of the missile. The North state media, as we said, did launch that missile earlier today. Australia's uh, foreign minister had more to say about this. We'll have that report in a moment. In the meantime, we continue to monitor the coronavirus situation across the world as we bring you the global update. And I'm sure that we can have that report right now. Uh, the North Korean, uh, the South Korean minister meeting with Australia's foreign minister, uh, both of them speaking about the North's nuclear launch earlier today. Uh, in re and regarding the announcement uh, that, it, uh, that North Korea has conducted long-range uh, cruise missile launches over the weekend, I don't intend to speculate on what the intentions uh, might have been uh, with those uh, launches, but I would reiterate Australia's consistent statements that have called on the DPRK to make a sustained commitment to talks with each of the Republic of Korea uh, and with the United States. Well, we're also following other health issues across the world. So, uh, there's a case of dengue fever in India's Uttar Pradesh, is a northern state in the country. And since the start of September, authorities have launched a campaign to destroy mosquito breeding grounds. 58 people, they say, many of them children, have died of the disease in Uttar Pradesh alone, raising fears that the state is in the midst of its worst dengue outbreak in years. Hospitals in the state have set up dedicated special wards for dengue patients. Dengue fever, which can cause intense pain in muscles and joints, is spread by the bite of the Aedes aegypti mosquito. The insect thrives in the megacities of the tropics, particularly in stagnant water. Keeping an eye on the situation in Guinea following the coup last week, a senior consultant in the Economic Community of West African States Commission says he's optimistic that ECOWAS will facilitate the restoration of peace and stability in Guinea as soon as possible. Ken Ife is the lead consultant of ECOWAS Commission. He said specific details of the delegation's visit to Guinea have not been announced and the organization might send more delegations to conduct further consultations with the military coup group in Guinea. A delegation from ECOWAS arrived in the capital Conakry on Friday for talks with the leader of the coup that removed President Alpha Conde. The envoys, including Jean-Claude Cassibro, president of the ECOWAS Commission, and Ghana's foreign minister, foreign affairs minister, Shirley Ayoko Bochwe, 
held a closed door meeting with the leader of Guinea's coup army, Mamadi Dumbuya, and then they visited Alpha Conde, who was detained in a military camp. First mission is usually to go and find out if the president is still alive, the one that was overthrown, and then the, you know, the, his officers, and then to know, you know, what condition are they living under, and then maybe to demand uh, that they be released unconditionally. So things like that's the beginning. They might now send a second mission to lay down conditions that, you know, you have to organize an election and get a new uh, uh, democracy. Uh, democratically elected, so you don't know what the conditions would be. And I don't think they will be reluctant to have a, They have even announced that they are going to have a, a handover. I don't know when. But it shows you that there is not an aggressive regime. So I don't think that they're going to be a big problem to, to echo us, to, to deal with. We'll have the global update, I guess, in the next hour. But fancy a concert near London's waterways on a cool evening as summer winds down. You're in luck as Masayuki Toyama is here to make sure your dreams come true. Watch. Thank you. Masayuki Toyama is a concert pianist who has converted a canal boat into a floating performance venue where music lovers can enjoy private recitals on cruises traversing London's waterways. The captain and pianist of the piano boat, currently moored in Uxbridge, just outside London, says the vessel is the only one of its kind. It's really nice to be able to to talk to people as who are there as the audience because I mean I still play um, in regular concert halls as well but when you play in a 4,000 seater there's the, the the lighting is blinding and yes that you can sort of make out that there are people sat there but it's a very you project in a different way but here I think the, the whole intimacy of it you know really sharing the musical moments and for me to to actually talk about the thoughts without having to use a microphone or shout at the top of my voice it's it's a really different experience and to be able to talk to people who were there afterwards is also great. Rihanna Henderson, manager of the project, said the idea of a floating concert venue came about when they were living on a narrow boat with a digital piano that was drawing interest from passers-by. It's all been a bit surreal really because we only started less than two months ago mm. um, and and already you know our cruises are sold out for months which is amazing you know as a new business just after covid as well um, it's really exciting and so it's been it's been very nice that the, the positive positive response from everyone has been so great but um, I mean I guess at the moment we're just sort of taking it as it comes and just you know not taking it for granted that that it's been it's been a great six or seven weeks or whatever it is. Toyama agrees the recitals on the boat create a unique interaction with the audience. Well, I suppose the balance with actually having the very few people um, to be able to share the space is great. It is a very different experience for a 4,000 seater or anything in between. It is about projection and it is about making sure that the musical shape and everything really reaches the, the back row, the very last row, whilst making sure that the front row aren't uh, um, inundated, or what's the word? Uh, overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. <laughs> overwhelmed either. But here, I think, it's, it's, more, it's more crafting the music, I think, because every little detail would really mm. be there to share. and music definitely makes a good impression on the audience and all were opportune to hear.
And I hope that's enough to at least set the mood for your week. Thanks for watching The World Today. I'm Amarachi Ubani.